title of this message is Choices. Principle, Scripture teaches life is the result of the choices we make. Turn to Jeremiah, the 38th chapter, verses 1 to 6. As you're turning, the background, Judah is under threat of invasion by a nation called Babylon. And the prophet Jeremiah has been having a very hard time because he's undertaken to speak the word of God in truth. And what he says is not liked by the people that he's talked to. They don't want to hear it. And as a result, we're speaking the truth in God's word and telling them that they have to make a choice. It's not readily received. And we're going to read verses 1 to 6 to see the message. This is uh, chapter 38, the book of Jeremiah. Verses 1 to 6. <clears throat> then Shapathiah, the son of Matan, Gedaliah, the son of Pashur, Jukal, the son of Shalemiah, or Pashur, the son of Malchiah, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken unto all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, He that remaineth in this city shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. But he that goeth forth to the Chaldeans shall live, for he shall have his life for a prey, and shall live. Thus saith the Lord, This city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. Therefore the prince had said unto the king, We beseech thee, let this man be put to death. For thus he weakeneth the hands of the men of war that remain in this city, and the hands of all the people in speaking such words unto them. For this man seeketh not the welfare of this people, but the hurt. Then Zedekiah the king said, Behold, he is in your hand. For the king is not he that can do anything against you. Then took their Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Malchiah the son of Hamalek, that was in the court of the prison, and they let down Jeremiah with cords in the dungeon. There was no water but mire, so Jeremiah sunk in the mire. Now Jeremiah's crime is that he's spoken the word of God and given them a choice. He says, if you go out to the Babylonians and you surrender to them, they will treat you justly. They will not invade. They will not destroy the city because I put it in their heart not to do so. But if you stay in the city and you remain defiant, they're going to come in, they're going to attack, they're going to conquer, and they're going to take you away captives. Well, they didn't like to hear what Jeremiah had to say. They preferred him to say, well, God will give us a victory, uh, no problem, it's all, uh, God is going to take care of it. No, they didn't like to hear what Jeremiah said, because what Jeremiah said dealt with them submitting to an enemy, to a pagan group that's stuck in their craw. Well, God is doing this because he wants to humble them. And of course, they choose to make the wrong choice. Pick it up now in Jeremiah 39, verses 1 to 7. And we see what happens as a result of the choice that they make. Now their king, Zedekiah, was in actuality a wimp. He was scared, he was afraid of the princes, of the individuals that held power under him. He was afraid that they would basically come against him and he wanted to do everything that he could do to please them, which cost him heavy. Jeremiah 39, we're going to read verses 1 to 7. The ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, the tenth month came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. 
In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up. And all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate, even Nergal, Sharizer, Shamga, Nebu, Sashem, Rabsares, Nargalar, Shizer, Rabmag, with all the residue of the princes of the king of Babylon. It came to pass, and when Zedekiah, the king of Judah, saw them, and all the men of war, then they fled and went forth out of the city by night, by the way of the king's garden, by the gate, betwixt the two walls. And he went out the way of the plain. In other words, he sneaks out and under the cloak of darkness, thinking he can get away. But the Chaldean's army pursued after them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him, they brought him to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Ribla in the land of Hamath, where he gave judgment upon him. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah in Ribna before his eyes. Also the king of Babylon slew all the nobles of Judah. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon, where he died. So the choice that they made sealed their fate. Jeremiah was not left in the dungeon. He was taken up and brought forth and lived to see them going to captivity and prophesied that they would be in captivity for 70 years and then be released. Now this brings about a principle. What is the principle? The principle is that scripture teaches the word of God defines the way of life and death. The word of God defines the way of life and death. In other words, abiding by the word of God will always result in experiencing life. Rejecting the word of God will always result in experiencing death. Now what is death? Death is defined as separation. Here in this life, <clears throat> Standing in opposition to the word of God brings death, temporary separation. But beyond this life, it becomes a permanent separation. Now, turn to John, the sixth chapter, verse 63. And here we find the word of God being described. Several passages of scripture. John, sixth chapter, Verse 63. John 6, verse 63, we read, It is the spirit that quickeneth gives life, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Amen. Turn to John 15, Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 3. John 15, verse 3. These are all descriptions of the word of God. Now you are clean. The word clean there is literally pure. Through the word which I have spoken unto you. The word of God gives life. The word of God gives purity. Turn to Hebrews, fourth chapter, verse 12. Hebrews 4, verse 12. Hebrews 4, verse 12. For well, the word of God is quick 
and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So we see the Word of God described in these terms. The Word of God can never be bound. The Word of God can never be stopped. The Word of God can never be destroyed. The Word of God gives life. The Word of God gives strength. The Word of God gives purity. The Word of God gives truth. The Word of God is truth. Having said that, brings us to the next principle. Scripture teaches following the Word of God brings life. Rejecting it brings death, separation. And we're going to see where this first started. Turn to Genesis, the second chapter, verse 15 to 17. Man's whole history is a record of rejecting the Word of God. Genesis, the second chapter, verses 15 to 17. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. The word went forth, the word was spoken, in no uncertain terms. Now turn to Genesis, third chapter, verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. The word contrary to the word of God is spoken. Here we have the principle set in motion. The word is spoken, and another word contrary to it is spoken. And we see the example of what happens. Turn to Romans. Book of Romans, fifth chapter, verse 12. Did the word spoken come to pass? Romans 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Yes, the word of God came to pass. And the day that they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they died. They became separated from life, separated from all that the word would be compart to them. We said that the word is life. We said that the word makes one pure, clean. We said that the word is quick, it's living, it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. So they experienced the result of standing in opposition to the Word of God because they experienced everything apart from the blessings of the Word of God. And that very day, curses came upon the human race. And it's still flourishing. <laughs> Let's turn to... Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 7, Scripture teaches, The carnal mind 
human mind has been crafted by Lucifer to reject God and God's word. And so lives perpetually separated from life. The human mind was created by God to be a beautiful thing. Man, when he was originally created, exhibited abilities in a level of existence never achieved since the fall. Lucifer has had thousands of years to program man's mind, to craft man's mind to the state of corruption that it currently is. And as it currently stands, the human mind is not capable of receiving the word of God in its natural state. Romans the eighth uh, Romans the eighth chapter, verse seven. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, but is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The carnal mind is so corrupted that God does not use it, does not become involved at all. The carnal mind stands in opposition to God, everything that God stands for, and the word of God. So when you speak the word of God to an unsaved person, they're going to receive it and basically reject it unless they're acted upon by the spirit of God to be open to the word of God. In the natural state, the carnal mind will is programmed automatically to reject the word of God. Turn to Ephesians, second chapter, verses one to two. Here man's state is laid directly at the feet of Lucifer, Satan. Ephesians, the second chapter, verses one to two. And you, hath he quickened, made alive. How did he make, him, make us alive? Through the new birth. You, hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Dead in trespasses and sins. Separated from God. Separated from the person of God, the word of God, the blessings of God, all that God represents, the life of God. We were separated dead in trespasses and sins. Why? Wherein, in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Everybody that's born in this world comes under the influence of Lucifer who corrupts the mind, corrupts the thinking to the point where the mind is programmed to stand in opposition to God and the things of God. Among whom also we all in our conversation or lifestyle in time past in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind <coughs> And we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. The carnal mind stands in opposition to God, the things of God, the way of God. What does God do? God condemns the Adamic order, the Adamic race. Everything that man stands for is under that sentence. God goes about doing a act of creation, making man a new creation in which he now functions differently. And God establishes a relationship with his new creation and is able to work within his new creation to bring forth that masterpiece that he has ordained from eternity. Scripture teaches, through the new birth, the saint is recreated with a Christ-like mind 
which can perceive God's way in all things so he can make right decisions. 1 Corinthians 2nd chapter, verse 15 to 16. First Corinthians, second chapter, verses 15 to 16. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. In Christ, all things become new. No longer under a judgment, no longer under limitation, no longer programmed to reject God, and the ways of God, and the word of God. Recreated to be <clears throat> at one with God, in harmony with God, the ways of God, the word of God. Recreated so that we can partake of the word of God in all its attributes. We can be able to think as God thinks. In that respect, we will always, in Christ, make the right decision. Jesus never made a mistake. Why? Because he was always in tune with the Spirit of God. Would you lead him in doing the right thing at the right time, making the right moves in every aspect of his life? Scripture teaches the saint is to allow his new nature to dominate his life. If he does not, he will again become separated, dead in trespasses and sins. In other words, God gives us the potential to grow into a life in which all the decisions we make will be in line with God, the word of God, and therefore right. But we have to take the steps to enable it to happen in our life. God's not going to force us to operate in the new nature, in the Christ nature. He's not going to force us to develop the mind of Christ. That's a decision he leaves for us. Turn to Romans, the 8th chapter again, verse 13. Romans 8, verse 13. Romans 8, 13. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. In other words, you will be in a position in which you will function the same way you did before you came into a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, you mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. You make a sovereign decision that we are going to put on the new man, as Paul speaks about, book of Colossians, the third chapter. We're going to put on the mind of Christ, and therefore we begin to function as he functions, think as he thinks, understand as God sees all things, and then you'll be able to perceive the right way, the wrong way. A way that brings benefits because you'll be living by the Word of God. Putting the Word of God in motion and benefiting from all the attributes of the Word of God. And lastly, Scripture teaches the saint is to fill his mind and thoughts with the Word of God and be prepared to reject thoughts that run contrary to it. Turn to 2 Corinthians 10th chapter verse 5. 2 Corinthians 10th chapter, verse 5. 
Remember what we said. The word of God makes a statement. Along comes the devil and makes a counter statement. The individual has to make a choice. Which one do we abide by? Well, in Christ, the instructions are casting down imaginations. The word imaginations are reasonings. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We fill our mind with the word of God, the ways of God. Therefore, when a thought enters our mind which is contrary to what you know to be the word of God, you don't reason it out and try to compare in your mind, you immediately eject it because it's running in opposition counter to what you know to be the word of God and therefore what you know to be true and therefore what you know to be the right way to go. What happens in Christians' lives is they become hesitant between two ways. Do I go this way or do I go that way? Because the mind is telling them one thing, the word of God is telling them something else. The mind will tell them something that seems very logical and reasonable. If I do this, I should get that. The Word of God is saying something totally different. Do this, depend upon God to do that. And therefore, they make the wrong decision. The scripture here is telling us there shouldn't be any hesitation. If something comes into your mind that you know the opposite to what the Word of God is, the Word of God says you immediately don't even consider it, you reject it outright. You continue to fill your mind with the Word and the ways of God, and you will always, always, always make the right decision. Every wrong decision that's ever made is a decision that runs contrary somewhere to what God has said in His Word. The idea for us is to progress from babes in Christ to mature saints, rightly defining the Word of God. Only as a mature saint can you comprehend the fullness of what God is saying in His Word. As a babe, you cannot do that. That's why, as a babe, we're dependent upon the ministry offices of the church, the elders, the leaders of the church, because they have the wisdom to be able to impart to the babe what needs to be understood until the babe become a mature saint himself. And then he can rightly define truth from error in the word of God. And he doesn't need to be dependent upon men after that. He's totally dependent upon God. Because a man cannot get you to the throne of God. Only God can get you to the throne of God. Only God can give you the understanding of the pitfalls and the snares of this life and how to know the deceptions of the enemy. So in closing, understand the choices that we make determine the life that we live. And not only that, the choices you make today determine your future. The choices we make today will determine what we're going to be doing in eternity, a million years from today. God looks at us from that perspective. And when we develop the mind of Christ, we begin to see ourselves from an eternal, not a temporal, but an eternal perspective. And therefore, we're more inclined to make the right decision, which is a spiritually motivated decision, never based in the senses, the carnality, or the <clears throat> lust of the emotions. Right decisions are based in the spiritual maturity that comes from an understanding of the Word of God and the ways of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word that's gone forth. Help us, Lord to pursue and develop the mind of Christ. Help us, Lord, to seek your word and your word only. Help us, Lord, to be willing 
to reject those things that are contrary to your word, no matter how logical they seem, no matter how alluring they appear to be, but give us the strength, Lord, to walk away from them when it's in an opposition to your will, your will and your word. Father, we give you the praise, the honor and the glory for all things. In the precious, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.